You're listening to the Wedding Biz Network, the voice of the creative entrepreneur. Come on, no! Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner with The Wedding Biz, and today we are revisiting an amazing, really fun interview with none other than Ron Ben Israel from April of 2018. This is the original interview with him. It is so worth listening to, and if you want more, listen to episode number 328, which was a continuation of a conversation with Ron from earlier this year. So enjoy this interview of Ron Ben Israel. Ron, you founded Ron Ben Israel Cakes, where you and your team bake delectable masterpieces. And I can attest to that because I'm having a tasting right now as we speak. And from 2011 to 2013, uh, you hosted the cooking competition TV show, Sweet Genius, and was a judge on the Food Network's Cake Wars. And I read somewhere that you said, quote, each cake is like a performance. My team and I feel like we are attending countless opening nights every weekend. Can you tell me more about that? First of all, you mentioned my team numerous times, which I'm grateful for. Yes. Uh, but it didn't start with the team. It started just by me uh, schlepping around my cakes, trying to convince people to order for me. And I still have to pinch myself that I have eight more people to help me with designing the cakes, meeting the clients, doing the bookkeeper, doing the bookkeeping, um, executing the cakes, delivering them. Uh, it's such a wonderful thing to be surrounded by talented people who are committed as I am to being each cake an opening night. Ah, yes. And I had a tour and I can see, you know, how people are here. It's really wonderful. I've heard that you have a very fascinating story. Now, you were born in Israel, isn't that right? Right. right. And when you were, what part of Israel were you born in? I was born in Tel Aviv, and both my parents uh, were Holocaust survivors from uh, Europe. And they came to Israel, and I was very lucky because they're both artistic and took me to see a lot of performances, and I was surrounded by creative people. So me seeking the arts was never an issue. On the contrary, it was encouraged. And I went to art school first. Can I ask though, Ron, for a second? So what did they each do? Uh Aha. Uh-huh. My mother was a cartographer. Uh, and in those days, each map uh-huh. was painted or drawn based on aerial photography. Uh, by so it hand, was all right? done by hand yeah. with rulers and special tools. But really, you needed a very stable hand because mm. you would trace photography. Um, so that very much inspired me. And my father worked in the publishing world. Um, the profession he specialized in was called uh, photolithograph. My father was a photolithograph, which is something that doesn't exist anymore. And that person would evaluate the process of matching the colors to get a print. So, for instance, my father would say, this needs 2% more yellow uh-huh. to match the original artwork or whatever was um, photographed. Oh, Sorry. interesting. So, um, basically, as computers came around, my father lost his job because oh. uh, things moved ahead uh, with a with a computer. And my father and never really understood that he mm. was more. And he was a great uh, paints, uh, a great draftsman and painter uh-huh. himself. So, I'm very lucky to be in a generation that was able to embrace technology. And I don't know how I would have done a business of cakes without having computers. I learned to bookkeep and, and keep everything organized with the Mac on my side. Yeah. And uh, social media came in just in time to help promote our oh, business. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to want to come back to that. But I'm curious, coming back to your parents and your upbringing. So you said they brought you, did you say you brought them to various art uh performances or what, mm-hmm. what, what What were those like? Can you be more specific? Like what really touched well, you? Well, for instance, I used to play the piano as a youngster uh-huh. and we had a theater troupe that rehearsed in our living room using my piano. In your living room? Yes. <laughs> so, and that became quite a well-known show. So as a kid, I would come from school and I would find out all those strange actors playing my piano and rehearsing. Wow. Uh, so I was very impressed with that. Yeah. And it didn't feel like a world far away. It felt like something I could do. Interesting. And, and like, what aspect of that do you feel affected your, let's say your passion for what you do now? Mm-hmm. Can, are you able to kind of zone in on it? Yeah, what absolutely. aspects of that? I spend years of therapy analyzing my motives. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
Well, I am a true New Yorker now, so everybody goes to therapy <laughs> here. It's hard to survive, and it's such a wonderful city with all the charms and, and seductions and challenges. Yeah. But uh, what I figured out early on is that I have two traits of personality. One is I need to make things. I'm not happy just writing or sitting in an office. I need to produce physical stuff. Mm. And that's why I always enjoy cooking with my mom and baking in the kitchen. And you did that as you were growing up? Lots yeah, of cooking and baking. Well, of course, I have a sweet tooth. Yeah, well, I, I relate was, to that. <laughs> I was also, but you're a musician, so you can produce sounds. Yes. And for me, that started, I did that, and I always did folk dancing, but in the kitchen, I was able to make things. Hmm. And I always loved craft, and then I went to art school. The other part of me, beside wanting to produce something, uh -huh. is to get attention. I'm, I, I don't think this will ever I resolve. love that you bring this up yourself, because none of us do, but go ahead, okay. It's the truth, it's, we, we need, all do. It's part of the requirement to do, be in the field that we're in, but go ahead, right? tell me more about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, if I was shy and retreating to a corner, <laughs> I wouldn't be performing initially, yeah. I wouldn't be showing my artwork, and I wouldn't be graduating into cakes, which requires the business side, and definitely a show-off. Oh, yeah. Uh, so every client that comes through the door, I basically audition for the part. You know, I need to get the sale, but more than that, I need to, to jump to the occasion, be creative, be inspired, and communicate with people. And then delivering the final cake, we get a lot of attention. The cake is center stage beside the bride and groom. <laughs> I, I, you had to say that. Um, but coming back, I'm still curious, what kind of art, when you went to art school, what kind of art was it for? What were you doing? Well, I went for four years for a degree in um, fine arts. Uh -huh. So I learned sculpting and drawing and drafting and everything to do with that, yeah. which really proved very helpful when I started doing cakes yeah. because I could sketch them. Ah. And when I learned sculpting in school, we spent a lot of time uh, in molding. Mm -hmm. So that was when I started doing cakes and I wanted to make my own tools. Yeah. I was versatile with silicone moldings. So I could sculpt oh. my own creations. And specifically, I was interested to get away from what was the standard in wedding cakes. We had a lot of basket weaves and festoons of frostings that didn't make any sense to me. But based on my art studies, I could talk to a bride and say, oh, you're wearing a lace dress. Why don't I get a swatch of that from uh, the wedding designer and cast it in silicone so your cake will have particular lace effects? But what were you thinking when you were in school? What was your intention when you got out of school? Because I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't oh, cake. Oh, well, when I got out of school, first of all, I was drafted to the Israeli military. Uh, so I had to which spend, is a requirement for all young men and women. Right, yeah. Men and women. Yeah. So I had to spend three years mm. uh, in that environment. Not that I embraced it, but it was, I was obliged. Can I, can I ask you something about that, though? I mean... I, I mean, I'm Jewish and actually I lived in Israel when I was a year old. My father was uh, a wonderful anthropologist and mm. for his dissertation, for his PhD, he was studying immigrants from India to Israel. So we lived on a Moshav, Mitzel if I am right. saying that correctly, it was in between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, I think closer to Jerusalem. And, um, and I know I, I went back a few years ago. Actually, I'll say this too. I have royal blood in me. My cousin was the prime minister of Israel at the time, Moshe Sharet. Wow. You know, first foreign prime, uh, minister. And so, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I know about the sense, well, I know something as an American about the sense of nationalism, you know, in Israel, which, which I, I, I mean, when you had to go into the army, uh, how did you feel about that? I mean, I would think that setting aside a sense of nationalism, you just get out of school, you know, and, and now to kind of interrupt that uh, mm -hmm. trajectory, or is it just something that you knew you would be doing when you were in college and that you're going to have a three year stint right. in the military? It's inconceivable, at least at the time I grew up, not to serve yeah. because everybody goes. To yeah. Okay. So uh, there was no choice in the matter. Yeah. But also being grown up in Israel, uh, having grown up in Israel, mm -hmm. um, I was allowed to express my feelings about it. So not everybody is intended to become a general. Uh, yeah. And complaining is part of the Jewish trait. <laughs> so I could have had my own conflicts and still serve, mm. which I appreciate because I didn't have to pretend that I wanted to be a warrior. Yeah. And I had my own conflicts regarding politics and regarding... Uh, 
the Israeli occupation. Ah. Uh, but I could still live with it. You know, uh, as you mature, I found out that one can live with conflict and have uh, different opinions and also opinions about our uh, existence can change. Yeah. So it's true that I love my country and I feel devoted to it, but uh-huh. I do have some conflicts regarding the way we run it. But that also applies to Americans, which I'm one of... I'm an American now, and I can still have conflicts about where yes. I live. But here the army is voluntary, unless there's a draft. And yeah. in Israel, the army is compulsory. So I just had to do it. So, in, And I would think that, uh, that there was a sense of discipline that you learned. I imagine you must have learned a lot from the military that you were able to apply later to your business. That's the official uh, policy. The, the official version of my life story is that I got a lot of discipline serving the army. My true feeling between you and I sure. is that I brought discipline to my service <laughs> because I met uh, people, especially Jews from all over the world, diaspora, uh, you know, we have, I think, 83 different countries that people mm. came from. You mentioned India. Yeah. So it was quite a shock because I lived in north of Tel Aviv where most of the population was uh, European born. Huh. Uh, so I was exposed to variety of uh, levels of income, level of interest. Mm. Uh, nobody in my vicinity in the army was interested in the arts. Uh, so my nickname was Stravinsky because I had those tiny little uh, vintage glasses. Oh. But that was cute. Yeah. It could have been worse. <laughs> um, you know, so I felt that actually I was more disciplined than a lot of my fellow soldiers. Oh, interesting, going into it. So coming out of, out of your service, what did you do next? So while I was in the Israeli service, a good friend from art school uh, came to visit, and he said to me that he started taking modern dance classes. Uh-huh. And I always liked uh, folk dancing, but that was uh, sort of unofficial. Yeah. So he said, next time you have a night off, a few hours, why don't you come to the studio with me? Hmm. So I picked him up in the dance studio and I saw uh, it was very sweaty and humid uh, and the teacher was drumming and it was very exciting. And I said, let me try that too. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I did and uh, I was fascinated. You know, it just fit me. I I, I got it, so to speak. Uh I wasn't able to do all the movement, but I wanted to do it. Yeah. So every chance I had, I would try and do a ballet class or Hmm. modern dance class. And it was funny because I would stand in the bar, next to the bar, Uh uh, with all those little girls in pink tutus. Uh And meanwhile, my army uniforms was hanging in the locker room. (laughs) But it's something that started uh, awakening something in me because... Ballet and modern dance have discipline. Yes. Very creative, and I love the music. Uh-huh. So the moment I was released, I was in class. Wow. And I did it for a few years. I apprenticed, and I worked really hard to, to train my body, which was already a mature body. Yeah. Uh, but luckily, I was able to be accepted to different companies. Oh, interesting. And uh, that started a 15-year career. 15 years? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> So, um, so you toured and traveled with, with yeah. the companies and what, what part of the world? Was it mostly in, in uh, mostly Israel? Mostly Europe or? and North America, yes. Wow. And how did that influence, do you think, you? Uh, when you're in it, it's totally different than looking on the outside in, but it's a whole world. Uh, and really, you, when you talk to dancers, nothing else exists. Yeah. You know, uh, it's very all or nothing world. And honestly, I would have continued forever if I could, but my body was just rebelling on me and I started having injuries and I started aging because remember I started exploring that when I was 21. Yeah. So by the time I was nearing my forties, which is anyway time to retire for any dancer. Yeah, sure. um, It just wasn't doable. And uh, at that point I ended up in New York and I really wanted to stay here. So I were, were you were you here to perform? Is that how yes, you came? Yes, I came in to perform, and I was able. I had an artist visa, so I continued doing different things with Israel. I worked for the Israeli Dance Library. I did guest performing, mm. different festivals, but ultimately there was no way for me to stay here and dance fully fledged professionally as I was used to. Yeah. And I had to find, like many other dancers and performers, alternative ways of. Income. Yeah. So 
I, how did you get from there mm. to creating this incredibly successful, wonderful company? It's funny. I usually don't think about it because I just kept on working uh, in different disciplines. But mm. let me think. I think what happened is I tried a lot of different careers. And one of it, uh, and it's a lot to do, I believe, in meeting the right people, networking. Um, I'm not the type that is successful by answering an ad in a paper and sending mm -hmm. a resume. Yeah, I really have to find uh, inspiration or the direction through life's um, ups and downs. Yeah. So I met an acquaintance who was an, a designer for showrooms and shop windows. Okay. And he asked me if I would like to help out. And that one week became a permanent job where I was working on showrooms, setting up uh, a lot of china and jewelry in uh, trade shows mm. in Javits Center here. We have a wonderful building, 41 Madison Avenue, which is devoted to the tabletop, tabletop yeah. industry, yeah. which is devoted to the tabletop industry. So we worked in those showrooms setting up the merchandise. Okay. And that's a fascinating world by itself, and I still visit once in a while. Huh. And meanwhile, I always loved to cook and entertain, and I would bake cakes at home and bring them to the crew at lunchtime. Ah. So here's how fate works, which is funny. I always feel that God is laughing and we are getting hysterical. <laughs> uh, but it's almost like a wink in Buddha's mind, yeah. right? Oh, I love um, that phrase. So this designer said, well, since you like to do cakes, how about design some cakes to enhance the China patterns? So he did a few things. He gave me the idea unconsciously of, on his part that cakes could be influenced by other sorts. Cake could be influenced by other media. For instance, China patterns. Ah. You don't have to go to school and learn how to do those piping, which is very old fashioned. Mm -hmm. You can look at other art forms. Yeah. So he talked about China patterns, and I also looked at some fabrics okay. and devised some cakes to enhance the products at the showroom. Interesting. And that started rolling on its own almost. People saw this, and then they started asking me uh, for commissions. And the next big job, the next big job was two, two windows in a storefront on Fifth Avenue that belonged to the Japanese pearl company Mikimoto. Okay. So I've done a couple of cakes for the windows. They're very cute. They're like little vitrines overlooking Fifth Avenue. Uh -huh. And practically people would stop and go into the shop yeah. and inquire about the cakes. <laughs> the idea was for them to inquire about yeah, the right. pearls. I, I get that. So That's wonderful. So people would just come in and uh, there was no business card, no nothing. Yeah. So lo and behold, people would ask um, the store clerk about uh -huh. my details and would call me and say, could you do a cake for my daughter's wedding? Or, and I had no idea how to even bridge that gap. Yeah. And also to scale it like that, right? For a hundred people or whatever. Right. So I started taking classes. That's the thing. You, uh, what kind of classes? Well, cake design and oh, cake okay. baking. Okay. The point is that actually I would like to make, uh -huh. um, today with the success and affluence of social media mm -hmm. uh, and web, which I benefit from greatly, there's an illusion that you could learn things online, technical things online. Yes. Now, you would not attempt necessarily to learn how to uh, electricity online, to be an, a plumber. You need the hands-on to unclog a sink. Mm. Um, but So I don't understand why anybody would think that by watching one of my videos, they'll be able to do what we do. Right, here. right. Uh, I knew better. I knew from my art training that uh -huh. I need to seek ways to learn. And uh, I went to school and I met a person who became my mentor, Betty Van Ostrand, who is very well known in the industry. She trained thousands of people. Okay. And beside taking uh, legitimate classes, I also would work as an assistant, clean the classroom, befriend the teachers, and start to learn privately, ah. attend cake competitions, just to get as much hands-on experience. I also did internships where I would go for a week to a bakery and just learn how to ice cakes repeatedly. Yes. And I'm always grateful for them that they would let me ruin all those cakes <laughs> until I got... <laughs> But, you know, you also, I, just for a moment, you also make a really good point is, is to initiate 
and to kind of take control of your situation and not because I think there's a I think there's a certain contingent of people that, like you said, they watch a video, they think that's how they're going to learn. They attend classes. Okay, that's it. But mm-hmm. to actually take the initiative to get out there and study with people, I I very much love having mentors. I've had mentors since I was eighteen in mm. all kind from business consulting, songwriting, music, mm. vocal, um, everything. You know, and so I love that you're talking about doing that yourself Mm -hmm. to surround yourself and and to immerse yourself, you know, and Mm -hmm. not just wait for a teacher to teach you. I love that. I think it's critical. I I really don't, I'm not the type of person that plans a path or the future. I follow my instinct and many times I fall down on my face, but sometimes it's right. And then what used to be very popular at the time I started was the phrase, follow your bliss. And everybody used to fr- uh, to say it from Oprah to anybody else. Yes. So for me, it means you you try something that you're interested in. And if it fails, you either try again or you realize and you make yeah, a, a different adjust. turn. Right? Yeah. So when I did three seasons of um, Cake Wars on Food Network, we saw this again and again. People were very uh, interested in decorating cakes. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them had incredible talent. Mm. But... Some lacked the technical know-how how to build those cakes. And that's the reason, mm. which is ah, very exciting. from your art school and all of that and right. your jobs. So the technical know-how was yeah. missing. And that's why many of the cakes would end up falling down, <laughs> which was sort of exciting for TV, for the drama aspect. Yeah. But, um, you know, somebody has to teach you how to put together the cake, even yeah. how to bake correctly, how to ice the cake. Mm. There's no other way except to see not just the finished results, but the hand movement. So a good teacher in the culinary arts would show you actually how to stand. The person who taught me how to ice a cake years ago used to be a gym teacher and then opened a bakery in Long Island and Uh invited me to experience the process for one week. And the way he would teach his employees is, first of all, to stand correctly, to relax the knees, to lower the shoulders wow. and that would affect the wrist movement. Yes. Well, just like uh, playing the piano, just posture like the piano. and all of that. So as I, I straighten open, up right now with the microphone. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So when I talk to my employees, I look at the posture first ah. and it's not just targeting the final result of the sugar sweet pea. Yeah. It's how they approach the whole movement. Hmm. Are you familiar with the Alexander technique? No. A lot of musicians actually practice it. He was a British teacher and he influenced um, a lot of movement therapy. And it's something that as a dancer, I practiced. Yeah. And he, in the classroom, he would see, let's say, I remember one time a flutist came Uh and the teacher worked on the neck and shoulders and the sound of the flute became clearer and clearer because the person who was playing the flute Ah. was hunched over. Yes. You know what? In, uh, in, in one of my uh, bands, I had a singer who actually was on the Mickey Mouse Club and uh, she had some a fabulous singer. This is years ago. She had some issues that started to come up and I brought her to uh, Professor William Riley here in New York City. He's a very well-known vocal coach. And I, I would sit in on a lot of these uh, lessons for various reasons and coaching sessions. And he basically said to her, I mean, she was having a very hard time at our jobs. He He said, hold your shoulders back, you know, raise them, hold them back. Mm -hmm. The problem was gone. And then Mm -hmm. for many performances, I had to remind her that was the purpose of saying, Hey, pull back your shoulders. And I mean, a little more complicated than that, but yeah, I understand how much that can influence Mm -hmm. it. And we don't think about that. Right. So even with cake designing, sure. Of course. What happens when you work in the kitchen, usually people target the final result and try in any way to achieve it. Mm. But I know from my experience that unless you have a really good uh, back support, yeah. because we work on cement floors, so we install those rubber mattings, which are so shock absorbent, you mm. can stand for hours and still feel good about it. Yeah. Or when we work over, when we work on decorating the cakes, the final stages, we have lowered the chairs and the table so we cannot, we don't hunch over uh, the counter. Yes. So looking at your environment is extremely important and how you conduct yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think the same thing is when we meet clients, you meet people who are interested in your bands mm-hmm. uh, results. It's how I relate to them physically. You know, we like to serve cake. 
Uh, so it's not just about the cake, it's about what kind of plate you're serving the cake mm. and how you're physically relating to the clients. Is there a certain kind of um, rapport? So usually I don't sit across the table, I sit a little bit closer to the client yeah. just to share the experience. Yeah, you know, interesting too, what you're talking about, um, obviously, as you say, you learn certain techniques through various mentors and classes. At the same time, it seems a lot of this is just innate. You know, you in particular, mm -hmm. you Ron, somehow have an innate understanding of certain aspects of this. So, you know, in terms of having this innate sense, isn't it interesting? Where do you think that comes from? You know, it, 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 I guess it's something every artist has. There's something innate that they just know, you know, how to do something. This is beyond me. <laughs> You'll have to address this question yeah. to somebody in a different position. <laughs> I know it's hard. I just do it. And, you know, mistakes are a big part of the process. Uh, so trial and error. and yeah. Right. And we have a, a magnet on the refrigerator in the kitchen. Keep making new mistakes. Ah. So let's think about it for a moment. We know we're going to make mistakes uh -huh. because we keep searching for new solutions yes. and new ways. Yes. So we want to make new mistakes, but definitely we do not want to make old mistakes. So I have um, a lot of formulas and systems in place. Uh -huh. So when a new person joins our team as a student or an intern before they get hired, we want them to follow our system. And once they absorb it, then we look forward to integrating their own ideas. Ah. But first they have to learn the system. Yes. And the system was structured because I had certain ideas and formulas, but it didn't always work. Uh -huh. So, for instance, uh, we have a magnet that is with the name of the client, and it follows the cake from concept to completion. Okay. And we learned it because there were times that I mixed the cakes, and I didn't know who Oh, no. <laughs> it can happen. Okay. But all it needs is to happen once. Yeah. And then you have to figure out a way, never mix the cakes again. Uh -huh. So that's why we have the magnet following the cake and yeah. always attached to it. Yeah. Not to the cake itself, but to the board. Yeah. Until it gets into the box and labeled correctly, and then it can be delivered to the right location. I love what you're saying about make new mistakes. And, and if anything, encourage, go for it. Take the leap. I want to be sure you know the wonderful news of our latest show, Stop and Smell the Roses, with acclaimed lifestyle and event design expert, Preston Bailey. Not only will he share the secrets, tools, and technologies behind his extraordinary ability to create a theatrical environment out of any space, you will also discover more about the man behind the magic. Preston will reveal how his focus on personal growth has been the root of his professional success, and you'll have the opportunity for him to answer your questions along the way. Plus, Preston will be inviting onto the show many of the star celebrities he has worked with in the past, so you don't want to miss a single episode. We also have another great show on the Wedding Biz Network, The Business of Being Creative, with host Sean Lowe. Since debuting last May, his show has really taken off and he's continuing to bring you the creative business advice he's shared with accomplished industry notables. Be sure to take advantage of Sean's talkback opportunity by recording questions and comments from right there in each episode's show notes. So, if you are a creative who is turning your craft into a business or want to take it to another level, head to theweddingbiznetwork.com and take a listen to Stop and Smell the Roses with Preston Bailey and The Business of Being Creative with Sean Lowe. That's theweddingbiznetwork.com. So what about the business aspect of this? Um, you were starting to say this much earlier. That is a whole nother skill and ability, right? It's one thing mm -hmm. for you to have this artistry and to develop it, you mm -hmm. know, and then and to develop it with this vision that you start to uh, create. What about making it a profit you know, a profitable company. You're, you're mm. managing, first of all, you're hiring people, you're managing people, you're having to create structure, business, you know, finance and all of this. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did you do that? How did you figure that out? <laughs> that is a huge question. And I don't know that I have all the answers because I follow the same path that was created as I went kind along. Kind of unfolds before you. Right. Yeah. Um, but I have to say that I started by myself and I did not plan to have a business. Mm -hmm. And I do teach myself in an accredited school, the International Culinary Center, uh -huh. 
the International Culinary Center, which was founded as the French Culinary. Okay. And our beloved uh, late founder and director, Dorothy Kahn Hamilton, brought me in to teach. Uh -huh. I didn't even think I wanted to teach, and it turned up to be to be a second a secondary career. Teaching uh, became a secondary career for me. Yeah. But anyway, Dorothy's idea was that the more you teach, the more you learn. Mm. So along, studying by myself, then I, oh, so the reason I mentioned the school is because we have business courses, how to become an entrepreneur. Uh, and I teach some of those courses. Okay. But the crazy thing is I never took a course <laughs> And I never thought I'll have a business. It just people offered me to purchase my cakes before I even had a business in place. So the aspect of managing a business came later. Mm. Uh, you know what I mean? I would not have started a business unless there was... Uh, yeah, the demand. The demand. Yeah. And I think sometimes people just have a vision. It's sort of the American dream to have your own business. It's the American dream to have your business. Yes. And people decide to do that before they have the proof that either they can do it mm. and second, that there will be a need for it. What a good point. Yeah. Right. So my path was, uh, there was a need and I had to find a way to produce. Is, yeah. And I used to live on a six floor walk-up studio uh -huh. in Greenwich Village in yeah. Manhattan. So there was no way I could do cakes of my own. Yeah. And I had to find a commercial place to rent, mm -hmm. which, and, and I rented a space from a caterer at nighttime. And this turned out to be a great turning point because my cakes were from the beginning producing a certified location, which uh -huh. I didn't own, but I had a spot in and they were insured and I was surrounded by acting working chefs, ah. which changed the whole perspective because the caterer started recommending me. And when there was time to put my cakes in certified locations, when there was time to bring my cakes to locations which were top-notch, I already had the insurance and the facility. I see. Wow, interesting. And that took years. I, I did not have my own facility for many years, yeah. but I had a place to work it. I see. And, you know, the whole concept also of just uh, existentially combining business with art you know, I know that had been a struggle for myself, you know, as an artist, and then later having to apply business to it. And that, you know, it's interesting. I had, I've had a couple of people on the show that said to me that, um, you know, because I think most artists at first will say, oh, I can't stand business. I hate that I have to deal with that. Mm. Some of the most successful people say to me, you know, I learned to not only like it, embrace it, but feel that. Uh, the act of creating business structure can be a creative act. Mm -hmm. And to me, that I, I, even recently, that gave me a whole new perspective on, on the business. It, it, mm -hmm. it, it's just to see it that way. Mm -hmm. Why not take my creativity and look at business as a creative act? Right. Yeah. It, it, you bring such good points. But first of all, I never and would never call myself an artist. I think artists work in a different um space they create something that they need to create the target is more uh it could be a museum or a gallery but ideally an artist will not bend to what public demand is i do something that is more artisanal where i provide a service i provide a product uh-huh and it's the aim of the product is to please people. It's actually a perishable, edible okay. media. Yeah. So if somebody doesn't like the cake, I have failed. I cannot say I'm an artist and my cake should be hanging on the wall. It's designed to feed usually a large number of people. Hmm. And that keeps you humble uh, and uh, puts my work in different perspective. And that also allows me to bridge over to the part of business because since I sell a product, uh -huh. not everybody is going to like it. Mm. And that's part of it. Mm. Not everybody has to bow and say, you're such a great artist. You know, you can, the audience, the, the public can have the preferences. Uh, they have the right to shop around. Yes. So if they didn't like my, in quotes, music, right. they can go somewhere else. Yeah. Of course, I need to pay the rent and I'm thinking about the sale, but ultimately I'm doing a service. Hmm. Well... You do have an enormous amount of people who love your uh, your service. <laughs> what about the entertainment aspect of it? Now, uh, 
you know, being that you uh, were on TV for a couple of years mm-hmm. and uh, who knows what might be in your future, you know, the various uh, media appearances that you do, um, you know, I do view you as charismatic too. So the entertainment aspect of this, how do you feel about that? You mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. That's that's also a great, big, big question. I, I, I like to ask big about, questions. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the previous question was also about the business. And I think it's not a business side, creative side. They're all bundled together. Mm. I think what we, what we call the business side yes. is being real, that we need to get money so we can buy supplies. Uh-huh. We can, in my case, when I started to pay for classes... And I looked at the customers as I was very grateful. They allowed me to do something that I love. Mm. So it's very important for me not to forget that, that people who celebrate the life occasions are allowing me to participate in that. And then I can be flamboyant. That's a beautiful way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and the business is really allowing people to shop with me. Mm hmm. And get, of course, a bespoke product mm. that you don't buy on a shelf, uh-huh. but um, we collaborate together on something. So the the business side in code is to serve that need. I have to buy and purchase products, ingredients, mm-hmm. and I have to pay other vendors and I have to maintain the truck and all that and the rent. But it's all uh, one hand one side that business side supports the artistic yeah, side. Yeah, the synergy all of together. all together. And there's a, uh, can be frustration in both yes. and join. I like when the business statement, I'm <clears throat> sorry, I like when the bank statement reconciles every month. <laughs> yes. you know, it's agony when it doesn't. Yes. But as a small business, I keep, uh, keep it very tight. Uh-huh. And of course, there's some losses. You know, we had hurricanes and Superstorm Sandy five years ago. Mm. And we all lost a lot because of that. Yes. Physically lost things, but uh, it's part of life. So being able to sustain the business and uh-huh. sustain our creativity for a long time is rewarding. Yeah. And that's, I, I try to remind myself when I get frustrated uh. with the so-called business side. Well, <laughs> yeah. So how is the TV experience for you? Um, it- TV is fascinating because I get a lot of attention. Uh-huh. And, you know, you do a few You mentioned seasons. you like attention at yeah. when you were younger. At least. I do a few seasons of TV and then for the rest of my life, I can walk the street and people would stop me and ask for <laughs> selfies. Yeah. So, of course, I like the attention. TV is different than also because it's a product, you know. I think rarely we, we relate to TV, especially the reality field as art, uh, it's reflecting situations. Yes. So all my appearances have been around cake and baking and also the wedding world. Uh, it's never been about my inner life. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, I perform as a baker, right. as a cake designer. Right. Well, and you were a dancer. You know how to right. engage and I do an dance audience. a little bit in those shows. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's furthering my career that is established as a cake maker. Mm. Uh, I'm not dancing my therapy session in front of the world. <laughs> I'm not talking about, you know, it exposes a little bit about my life, but I don't do those reality shows that they follow you around, at least not yet. Oh, I don't think that's in my future. I can't imagine, yeah. So I'm able to, even though when one does TV or in the public eye, I can also have some privacy. Uh-huh, yeah. And have areas that nobody comes to see if I go to a restaurant, people may recognize me, but believe me, you take the New York city subway. Most of us just want to get to work. Right. And, yeah. Um, but TV is a lot of fun and I go to meet thousands of people and interact with many. And, um, I like the discipline of shooting because these are long, long days and weeks mm-hmm. of working. Um, it's a little bit hard. Actually, it's not little, it's very difficult to balance the time that TV takes with Maya running the bakery. Oh, I imagine. And a lot of the production companies are now operating in the West Coast, in the mm-hmm. LA area. Mm-hmm. So I had to take weeks weeks and weeks off from work, which is very challenging. Mm. And probably I would have been doing more if I was situated geographically differently. Mm. Uh, but I just can't leave the bakery in New York for long stretches of time. Yeah. You know, I'd like to transition to your process in working with a client. You know, from the time you meet them 
you know, what that's like for you, if you wouldn't mind taking me through a typical situation with a mm. client. Yes, I would love to show you <laughs> and talk to you about that. And it also relates to the question that most people ask us, how long it takes to make a cake? And it's impossible to answer exactly because it could take months of preparation. Of course, everybody wants a fresh cake. Uh -huh. But in order to get there, uh -huh. we typically start months and months in advance because people would call or communicate here mm -hmm. and would tell us that the wedding date is in advance, hopefully, even though we do get last minute. And uh, people would make an appointment to come to our showroom and design studio to sit with us, many times with me, and talk about the various aspects of the occasion, yes. whether it's a wedding or an anniversary, a birthday, and so forth. So everything is done bespoke, just like getting a wedding gown made out of scratch mm -hmm. or a suit and so forth. So over the phone or by email, we vet each other. You know, We need to talk about pricing, availability, expectations. Uh, people would see our work online and they need to be educated about how much it costs to produce. Mm. So we try to narrow down the fields so people who come in will not be disappointed uh -huh. uh, and that they will be, able to, will be able to serve them appropriately. Yes. How diplomatic am I? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. You know, and actually just a little side uh, note about that. Pricing art. You know, I, I don't, people, I don't think the public can't really fully understand um, it's so much more than just the hours, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, the cost of material, cost yeah. of delivery, all of that. There's a lifetime of experience that's put into this. Yeah. Yeah. How do you put a price on the art? So I just had a recent experience, which was very similar to ordering a custom cake. I was given for a special birthday, a gift certificate for a bespoke suit. Okay. Which I never had a suit made to me. Huh. Not even made to measure. Uh -huh. We're talking about making a pattern just for your body. Mm. Um, it's an amazing experience, very costly. Uh -huh. So all my friends got together for my birthday and gifted me that experience. Oh, wonderful. Uh, it took about four months because oh. I was very particular, of course. And they <laughs> were five different fittings. So I made an appointment and then I went to the showroom of Michael Andrews, downtown Manhattan. Uh -huh. And I started looking at different cuts of a suit, which was a whole process. It took about two hours because I needed to learn about the possibilities. Mm. And then we started looking at fabrics. Okay. And thousands of options. Oh, I can't imagine. Just like tasting cakes, yeah, right? Yeah. Then I started looking at the buttons ah. and the thread that will stitch the button holes. Wow. And endless amount of details that I could customize. Huh. And it was overwhelming. So I couldn't make all the decisions in one time. I had to come again. Yeah. I made a second appointment. Just like our, like, like our beloved customers who need to taste the cake once or twice. I did make the decisions, uh, but the whole, the whole process was fascinating because I made decisions, I specified what I wanted, and there was a fitting, actually two fittings. Uh, we can have fittings in cakes, but you can mix and match and get a sense of, by photographs and sketches, what the cake will look like. Yes. But ultimately, there's a difference between fashion and cakes. The cake will be one of a kind, mm -hmm. freshly made product. Yeah. So clients need to trust us because there's no way to make a rehearsal on the cake. Yes, yes. Huh. It's just like the caterer could present some tasting of the food, but ultimately they have to serve and create the food for a large number of servings. Yeah. You can work with a photographer and get a feeling about their work, but ultimately, they'll do and record a live event. Yeah, I love what you're saying. Right. Yeah. And no, the same thing for the music. Yes. In the moment that it is created, presented with all the conditions, yes, it, it can be a, a completely different experience. A wonderful one, of course. But yes, there's a, an informed leap of faith, obviously. Yeah. Right. So, can you tell me one or two either favorite stories or stories that stick out for you mm. in your career in, in this business, designing cakes? Let's talk about some mistakes that I've made and never repeated. One evening in December, early on, I got two parallel orders, two wedding cakes. 
And one of it was for a celebrity, a Broadway star, which is very dear to my heart. Okay. And I didn't have a stock of packing materials. And it started snowing outside. Okay. And I had two cakes completed that I intended to deliver in a friend's Jeep uh -huh. without a cover. Oh, no. And I knew that the cakes would have just melted in the snow. Yeah. So I quickly called another friend. Luckily, I knew a lot of people in the design area. And they brought um, structure materials, uh, foam core, which you buy in sheets mm. from an art store. And I had to build my own boxes. Okay. And then I realized, and we're not, we're not talking about bakery boxes. Those cakes were two or three feet tall each. Mm -hmm. So after that experience, I learned to investigate where you can get commercially certified uh, shipping materials. And all our cakes, of course, are created and delivered safely. Mm -hmm. So this could have been a real disaster, luckily averted with some ingenuity. But the amount we spend on packing is extraordinary. Oh. And I always call, when I deliver the cakes and have to open them up in the location, mm -hmm. I even need to use a special knife because they are packed so securely. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so this is a, a funny story. But then let's talk about one of the largest cakes I've ever made, okay. which was 12 feet tall oh. and 8 feet wide. Oh, my God, so, Ron. Yeah, I know. This was a large cake. <laughs> okay. I, I would love to do a bigger cake than that one day. And I have a plan. Yeah. So we'll throw it out. So this cake was designed to commemorate the 100th birthday of the Plaza Hotel, which is a very iconic building. Yes. Built in the early uh, 20th century. And because it was such an important event, they invited thousands of New Yorkers to come and attend. And the cake was on public viewing. Uh, how do you deliver a cake like that? It arrived in 36 pieces, uh, was built inside a tent that later on was removed to unveil the cake. Uh, uh, we had 12 people working on it, <laughs> just full time. Yeah. It, it was an incredible process that I did not know exactly how it would end. So I just had to trust and delegate and plan and pick up the pieces and keep on moving. But making that gave me... I don't want to say self-confidence. Mm -hmm. It may it gave me healthy respect towards what could be achieved. Mm -hmm. So my secret plan is to do Versailles. Oh, wait, wait, when wait! You, but what do you mean by that? <laughs> I would love to do like this, a replica. Uh, yes, of I would love Versailles? because when we did the plaza, we had to work with the architects and the restorer of the building that was then going through major restoration. So we were privy to the architectural plans and we, we, were, we were asked to repeat or replicate every window, every balconet, oh every symbol, God. every plant. Yeah. So, and Martha Stewart did a short documentary of the process for her show. So I knew she would be counting huh. every little detail. Since Martha Stewart was producing a documentary about the creation of the cake, yeah. I knew she was going to count how many windows and ask me on oh, the air. Yeah. So I was super prepared. <laughs> uh, but uh, this whole experience showed me what could be done, hmm. but I don't take it lightly. It doesn't mean that it came automatically. There was a lot of, there were a lot of challenges to overcome. Yes. And I would love to take on a project like that in the future, let's say, the Versailles oh. or a palace or, or the, a Russian palace, but it would require a special client who, who would need that or mm. would want that. So probably it will be for a, a public occasion. Ah, yeah. Well, where do you see your life, your career in this field going in, let's say, five years from now, 10 years from now? Do you have any particular goals other than what you just told me about? I think I mentioned before that I'm not the kind of person that plans carefully where I'm going to be because I just work and I enjoy it or yeah. I'm challenged by it. So I definitely want to continue working. Some people talk about retirement or moving yeah. to an island. That's not me. I want to be involved. But from very much from the beginning, I taught and involved other people in the craft. Mm -hmm. So I see that as growing. I, I enjoy very much traveling. You know, there are cake shows all over the world. Oh. And I was invited to a few of them. Very interesting. So I traveled to Milan, Italy, and Canada, and Mexico City, mm. and 
uh, and here in the United States, many different uh, metropolitans. Where you speak, basically? Uh, I speak, but I find just speaking is not enough. So I usually would do a visual presentation. Either I would demonstrate uh, aspect of decorating, such as mm -hmm. wedding cakes or completing a cake. I would do video presentations about my work. Uh, I would pick up a topic for inspiration. Uh -huh. My last one was two weeks ago in Florida, and it was the relation between colors and cakes. Mm. So, uh, or I would talk to the wedding industry and I would give lectures about partnerships, uh, finance, uh, how to run a business, mm. the relationship between the cake and the wedding. So there are plenty of opportunities to grow in the educational and um, uh, inspirational field. Yes. And there's a lot of interest. So I would love to do more of that. Uh, I enjoy filming and doing TV. Uh-huh. Yep. It would be fun to do a scripted show, meaning playing a character. Oh? Of course, I cannot get rid of that accent, so <laughs> they'll have to write it for me. Sure. But I have been in, was it one or two different scripted movies where I did play a baker. Oh, yeah? But it was scripted, meaning, yeah, a TV show that was scripted. Uh, so you had to learn lines and deliver I had to learn them. lines and yeah. I had to obey cues and I enjoyed it tremendously huh. and also the pair of residuals which is very nice ah. in my field can you imagine that you would get residuals for a cake that's, a, that's fantastic so you get a little bit every <laughs> anniversary yeah <laughs> well we get our residuals so to speak uh, by recommendation so if people mm. refer to us based on their experience based on the positive experience yes. that's the best way to continue yes Uh, but I don't see myself not having a physical space with my name that produces cakes. Yeah. Uh, that's sort of where I like to come every morning and shut down every night. Uh, it's, in, it's enjoyable to have a space. Even though I would like to experiment more mm -hmm. with what I do, I need that brick and mortar space. Yes. So what is the best way for people to uh, reach you and, and get more information? It's so easy, you know. First of all, you can pick up the phone. Yes. <laughs> um, but And we'll I, have that in the show notes, by the way. Oh, We're going to put everything in the show so notes. So I used to say to everyone, just you look at the website, weddingcakes.com. With an S, weddingcakes. Weddingcakes.com. Yes. You can even look at Ron Ben Israel Cakes, Ron Ben Israel, with, without a hyphen. <laughs> okay. But they're all leading to the same spot, weddingcakes.com. But now it's so easy. You can look at Google. You can look at Yelp. Uh, all of these will lead you to our phone number, to our website, and to an email address. But we're also very lucky because we have Instagram and yes. we have Facebook. Please do not place a cake order on Instagram. Use this <laughs> Are people so trying to do that? In Twitter, on Twitter. Oh. They tweet me and say, I have an event tomorrow. <laughs> Can you on. do the cake? <laughs> so, uh, What is your Instagram handle? RBI Cakes. To make it short and sweet, RBI for RBI my initial cakes. cakes. And it's sort of like people would call me in the street, RBI cakes, hey. <laughs> Social media is wonderful to, to investigate, to get inspired. But the physical and actual connection with the person is very important. Yeah, I agree so, so call much. call me. Yeah, I agree. And, and also, when there's been space in between the conversation, I've been having uh, tastings of this, these cakes that you gave me, and they are delicious i can't describe it in words well, ron we should be able to describe cakes not just visually uh -huh. but also verbally so mm. can you use some adjectives well i mean delicious obvious obviously that one thank you but that's too uh, yeah, abstract i know oh now i feel like let I'm me being ask the question though. sure so let's let's talk about cake when you want to describe to a friend or a colleague yeah uh, the first thing i would ask was was the cake moist yes Yes, absolutely Thank moist. You. Then you can talk about the crumb. Was it tender or coarse? Tender. Thank you. Tender. <laughs> so the, we talk about the mouthfeel first. Yeah. Uh, also, what about the flavor? W was it intense or subtle? Mm -hmm. Could you f differentiate between well, it, different Well, some flavors? of it. All right, and, and also, I want to say very light also. Lighter than I expected. Looking at it, I love the feel in my mouth. But also... Uh, it, There are subtle and subtle flavors, and there are other moments that are not so subtle. Like when I I I got the lemon part, right? You know, so I like the variety uh, right. of of different bursts, and and like you say, subtle. I I really like that mix, that combination. Right. Yeah, and 
you know, we can talk for hours about the oh, science yeah. of flavor. And I may need to have a little more in order to better describe it. Absolutely, this. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we like to create this uh, relationship. But you come again and again <laughs> yes, and again. and again and again and um, again. But finally, what was the sensation in your mouth afterwards? Uh, specifically, did the, the taste linger? Yes. As a matter of fact, I love that you just asked that. When I have a really good meal, it's interesting, uh, certain foods and, and obviously the cake, that there's a certain flavor when it's first in your mouth and you swallow mm. it, and then there's the aftertaste. Right. And I love when there's a, a little surprise of an, and, and yet, and right now what's lingering for me, if I can describe this correctly, is that lemon flavor, which I kind of ended with, and it's right. still there. I don't know when I ate it like seven, eight minutes ago. Right. Yeah. It's, it's pleasant. So interesting because I have spoken to people who specialize in the science of flavor and taste yeah. uh, and even the medical professions. Each person is, the palate is different on each people. Yeah. The mechanism is the same, but uh -huh. we perceive flavors so differently. Hmm. So I think, and we could tell fortunes maybe by that, because <laughs> you responded to the citrus, which is actually passion fruit and lime and a little lemon. Uh, other people would say the chocolate stays with oh, them. Oh, interesting. So that's it's fascinating. very different, right. And that's why I would never say about uh, a food item that it's bad. Yeah. Because what's bad for me may be good for uh, somebody else. Yeah. But I would look at specifics. So the mouthfeel, while you taste is very important, you should go through different stages. Creaminess, uh, smoothness, tanginess. Mm -hmm. um, some cakes are even add a little pepper. Pepper? Like, uh, my carrot cake has a little cayenne. Hmm. And it just awakens all the hot. Uh -huh. Uh, receptors, but finally, if you use real butter, uh -huh. and good eggs, uh, specifically egg whites in our cream, your mouth would not be coated with that vegetable shortening that oh. actually seals the flavor receptors. Yeah, so it's very important that a taste of cake would allow you to taste other things as well and not just finish you off. Ah, whew, Death by cake, <laughs> Death by cake. Well, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Ron. This has been a blast. My pleasure. To cake. Yes. Thank you for listening to this re-release of an earlier episode on The Wedding Biz. If you enjoyed it, please share it with three friends or colleagues who you think would also benefit from hearing it. And follow us on Instagram and Facebook at The Wedding Biz. And you can follow me on Clubhouse at Andy Kushner. And be sure to join The Wedding Biz Club on Clubhouse. We'll catch you next time on The Wedding Biz.